the Sterling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel. And I'm pleased um, to welcome you to the beginning of our 16th annual Israeli Film Festival. Um, Professor Mark Bernstein's here, who's been involved in that for many, many years in teaching Israeli film here for um, 20 years or so. And um, we have uh, Dr. Vered Weiss with us, who also teaches Israeli cinema. And I'd like to thank our, um, our Israeli Film Festival, which includes Ariana Mensel and Michal Edan and um, Galit Peled and Yael Katsil was on um, our committee and um, we loved Muna and that was one of our selections. I'd like to think, thank our many co-sponsors for the film festival, which include the College of Arts and Letters, the College of Social Science, James Madison College, the College of Arts and Humanities, um, the Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Initiatives, the Muslim Studies Program, the Center for European, uh, Russian and Eurasian Studies, the History Department. Um, so we're just really thrilled to have wide, and, and Hillel um, as well. So we're, we're thrilled to have widespread support um, from across the university um, for the festival, and we're really looking forward to it. Uh, so we're very, very honored um, to have Amira Wad with us today. Uh, many of you already viewed her amazing uh, concert um, that we had virtually and that she made just for us, which was extremely, I think, powerful and moving and also um, left us with some hope as well. Uh, and <laughs> which is one of the things I love about Amira Wad is um, she, with Muna and with her songs and the concerts, she's difficult, um, uh, painful subject sometimes, but always leaves us with hope um, to move forward. And uh, and so with Muna as well. So let me let me first introduce Mira. As I said, she is an extremely multi-talented uh, actress, artist, creator, songwriter, singer. Um, you know, does so many uh, things. Uh, so she was born in Rama in a Palestinian village in the Galilee, north of in Israel. Um, has a Palestinian father, Dr. Anwar Awad, and a Bulgarian mother, Snejanka Izborska, and uh, two brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and she grew up in a politically involved family uh, with high humanitarian values. And we see that throughout Mira's work. Um, from an early age, she spoke out for women's rights, for equal citizenship for Palestinians living in Israel, a two-state solution, and for environmental awareness. And she continues to be an activist for these causes and a big believer in dialogue and coexistence. I'll say right away, and we'll mention it um, towards the end to remind you as well, um, but she has her own... Um, a clothing line and, 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 and cups and other things that promote, um, so I'm gonna ask her about so she can elaborate about it, um, but it's Good Work Project. So after I introduce, I'll, that'll be one of my questions that you can elaborate about that, but um, Ariana will put the chat in it. But that's some one of the many things that Mira does in terms of promoting education for middle schoolers um, for both um, uh, Palestinian Israelis and Jewish Israelis to get to know each other. Maybe this would be a good moment, Mira, for you to say a little bit more about that, and then I'll continue the introduction. <laughs> so sure. So, so one of the things, well, as you said, all, I'm a multidisciplinary artist, and everything that I've done ever with my art uh, also uh, was always to promote solidarity, human solidarity, and empathy, and dialogue. And so again, I have an online store where I put my designs. Uh, I design these logos uh, for peace and solidarity and um, I sell products and the profits go to an educational program called Shared Learning. It's an amazing educational program by the Abraham Initiative that bring Arab and Jewish middle school students to study English together. So they both come there on a, you know, on the same level of not knowing a language, trying to learn a, la a new language. So they come on the same, uh, in the same equal place and get to know each other. And this happens in mixed cities uh, where these communities share the space, share the city, but don't really get uh, chances to meet. Um, and, and here in this project, they sit in the same classroom once a week and study together. So it's an amazing project that I really believe in and that can make real impact for our future. Um, and so my store is dedicated to, um, to supporting this project, uh, hopefully many other projects to come as well. Thank you. So I encourage everyone to, to look at that as it can make a real difference in um, many um, kids' lives. and, and um, and create a better future for everyone. So, uh, so um, 
Mira Wad, uh, in terms of her singing career, started very early, has had many, many influences. Um, she attended Haifa University and studied fine arts and English literature. Um, she moved to Tel Aviv and studied music at the Rimon School for Jazz and Contemporary Music and later studied in the Body, Body Theater School. Um, she's done a lot of uh, theater improvisational workshops in Israel and um, Britain. Um, she fuses lots of different sounds, as many of you who, who um, watched uh, the concert, the fabulous concert that she did, she fuses Arabic and Arabic fusion style that combines uh, Western influences. Um, and she collaborates with, um, you know, musicians from all over the world. Um, as you know, at, she was here actually at MSU in 2010 with, uh, with Noah. Um, so, uh, at the Wharton yes. Center. So um, some of you were able to see her in 2010. And we also, um, so welcome back to MSU in that sense. Of, you know, yes. <laughs> and, um, and we also have shown in previous film festivals, episodes of Arab labor. And of course, uh, Mira's uh, acted in one of the main roles um, in that as it come also depicting the complexities also, but in a more humorous way of Palestinian um, citizens of Israel. Um, so she, as she mentions in her concert, competed in the Eurovision Song Contest in 2009 with Noah, um, singing There Must Be Another Way, which she sang um, at MSU and, and sang in the concert as well. Um, and they won the NIF Human Rights for Arts and Culture Award in 2010. Um, she has a debut solo album, Balawan Acrobat, and that was released in 2009. Uh, and... Um, she has released her sec the second album, All My Faces, uh, with, and uh, she established her own um, label-free indie world music label. Uh, and she released Write Down uh, that she composed for a documentary film about the late Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, which she also talks about and sings in the concert. Um, she won, I, I mean, there's so, she's just won so many different Are you things. reading my CV? I it's going to take forever. No, I cannot <laughs> mention them all. Um, but uh, she has just acted in multiple theater productions and multiple languages. Um, uh, and uh, is currently, I think, also uh, in a theater production um, I'm not, uh, as well, I think. In uh, so I, I just, and there's just so much. I mean, there's I mean, yeah. radio, is, there's pottery, <laughs> there's photography, there's so many awards, the Edna Fidel Award for Promising Actress, the Israel Cultural Excellence Foundation, Best Music for Theater Piece, First Prize in Songwriting, Composer of the Year. I mean, she's, she basically does it all, right? <laughs> so we will, you can go to her website and just be kind of inspired and humbled um, by everything that Mira does, but um, let's move on to maybe the questions. And you can talk, you can have any. I um I let I'll let Mira um say a few words, and maybe I'll ask a couple questions, and then um and then open it up uh, to the audience. But as cool. you could see, um from the concert and from Luna, um you know of course uh, Mira is inspired by her own experiences and uh, Palestinian citizens Israeli um, uh, experiences in terms of the complexities. Um, of uh, the identity of being a Palestinian citizen of Israel. And that is certainly one of our themes along with kind of um, highlighting women's experiences and women's empowerment as well. So let, let me first uh, have you say a few words, Mira, and thank okay. you so much for being with us today. First of all, thank you. Thank you, Gael, for the introduction. I think my, my, my cats are wrecking the house as we speak. They're probably going to jump into the screen as we talk. This is the reality in my house. Anyway, thank you for the introduction. Um, sorry to burden you with my long CV, but as I said, I'm, I'm apparently a, a bit hyperactive person and uh, I do a lot of things and in a lot of fields. Um, but we're here, we're convinced here today because of Muna, uh, the TV series that I've created. Uh, it's a it aired in Israel in in January 2019, but I have to tell you that I wrote the story in 2009. So it took exactly 10, 10 years for the story of Muna to reach from the paper to the screen, and um, as it coincides with the with the Eurovision in 2009, you can guess that the story was influenced by my experience of representing Israel internationally in a, in a pop contest in 2009. When I came back from Moscow, the Eurovision that year was in Moscow. And uh, as you said, 
Achinoam uh, Nini, Noah, you might know her as Noah, and I represented Israel in the Eurovision in 2009. And when I came back from that crazy, crazy experience, um, why do I say crazy experience? Because that year, our participation in the Eurovision coincided with a, the first big operation on Gaza, a cast led. So in the background of us uh, two peace activists trying to prepare ourselves for a pop contest in Moscow, in the background, there was shooting and bombing and the people were dying and, uh, and uh, we were on the edge of losing hope of, of any advance into uh, you know, a sane reality here in Israel, Palestine. It was a very difficult moment for us to go to go ahead. First of all, uh, with this with our collaboration, um, it wasn't an easy moment to decide to go for it and still represent Israel while the war is happening. It was not an easy place for me as a Palestinian citizen of Israel while Palestinians were being bombed in Gaza. But I decided to go ahead and and do the revision because I felt that. If I step on stage, I will have a chance to tell a story. But if I don't step on that stage, then I won't have that chance. And I, and th I think this is why I don't regret participating <laughs> eventually, because we did voice our voices. Like you said, the song was called There Must Be Another Way. And we brought our message of we have to change our reality somehow into a better one. Uh, we brought that to the Eurovision. So we did not shy away from talking about the issues. We did not sing a peace love song. We talked about the issues and the, and the mutual pain. But when I landed back in Israel after this huge, huge thing, experience, to the, to the bad and to the good of it, right? Because it was fun, it was amazing, it was a big exposure, but it was also very difficult. I got threats, my family got threats because uh, of, of the situation, I was treated as a traitor in the eyes of many, as a Palestinian or as an Israeli, doesn't matter. Some Israelis did not want me representing their countries at their country at the time. And some Palestinians believed that I was the fig leaf, you know, hiding, uh, 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 helping the Israeli propaganda to show a very nice image of Israel abroad. So it was not an easy reality. So when I landed back from Moscow, I knew that nobody can can you know can tell this story about this kind of identity being put in that very sensitive place of representing Israel uh, other than me. I have to write it down. So I did. I sat down and I wrote a short movie. It started out as a short movie called Muna already. And it was this story of this woman. Um, of course, it was much more condensed and with fewer characters. It was a short movie about this moment in time where this photographer gets this opportunity to represent Israel abroad, but there's uh, an operation in Gaza and this whole, and, and, and the news breaks to the media that she's going to represent Israel in the midst of this uh, a war and, and hell breaks loose in her life, in her personal life with her boyfriend and in her personal life with her parents who just cannot see how she can represent Israel in this moment. Um, so this is the background for what became later a TV series um, uh, of eight episodes uh, that went on to um, prime time in Israeli TV, in the, in the, in the national Israeli TV. Um, so this is the background. Um, and of course, I would like to use as much, much more time, like most of the time for questions. So please feel free, uh, who's moderating this, uh, Yael, are you? Um, yeah, I can uh, moderate it and you can just put your electronic hand up and then we want it yep. to be a discussion where we can see each other and exactly. you can just orally um, rather than a webinar and you can just ask your own question. Yes. Um, but I'll just try to moderate in terms of um, you know, when I see the hands go up and so forth. Cool. Uh, but maybe I'll, while people are thinking of their questions for you, I'll ask um, the first question, which um, I was moved by all your songs in the concert, but one of them was about being an acrobat kind of as a uh, Palestinian citizen of Israel and kind of trying to negotiate um, all, all these worlds. And certainly I think um, Muna is inspired by, um, uh, uh, to some extent, by your experiences, even though you're not Muna, right, in, in many respects. And so it seems like some of the different characters represent 
the different pulls perhaps that people feel with the best friend, Lani, uh, kind of wanting to just live his life uh, in Israel yeah. and the um, Philip character uh, being more, you have to kind of prioritize all the time, kind of also the politics and, and what's going on um, in Gaza and elsewhere. And so I don't, you know, I, I wanted you to kind of elaborate a little bit more about how, how the different characters maybe represent um, different pulls, right, and uh, that, that people face um, uh, and what they need to negotiate in, in, in terms of uh, living in Israel. So I wanted to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Actually, both characters are very much based on real people uh, in my life. And I did bring this, and they have a big, huge scene, these two characters, because I wanted to show this clash, which is the, the biggest argument, I think, for, uh, for an Israeli-Palestinian citizen or a Palestinian Israeli citizen, however you want to call it. Uh, this, do I, where do I belong? Who am I? I want to live my life. I want to be successful. I want to be prosperous, but I still have this connection, this tie with another people called the Palestinian people who live elsewhere and who are, are living under you know, a military regime and difficult conditions. So we are always on this, you know, on this uh, again, balancing act of, Okay, we want we want to live our life and just forget you know forget about politics and not carry history on our shoulders. We want to we want to have uh, you know uh, we want to open startups and we want to become artists and we want to appear on TV. But then again, there's always this complexity of of, of facing a, of not forgetting where we come from and what we belong to. And uh, I, yes, I wanted to use these two characters to bring this this very painful argument, which is kind of an inner circle argument it's it was it was this is something that i don't think a lot of israelis get to hear you know this argument between two arabs one of them is this uh, uh, i call him escapist you know he just wants to live the good life a young man who wants to live the good life you know go out with beautiful women uh, drink something smoke something make some money uh, travel around you know and this other guy who is who feels very very connected to the cause and to the history and to the injustice and uh, and to share that uh, that inner kind of uh, dialogue which happens only within the community to share it outside the community as well mm -hmm. um, because you know I, i'm sorry go ahead go ahead because sometimes i feel that um, there's not enough um, knowledge within the israeli community that the Arab community here is not one mono, monolithic, you know, uh, mass. We don't have one opinion, uh, and a lot of times, uh, if, if it's the media or the politicians or whoever, there is the big mistake of, of treating us as as one mass, as, as if we have one head, one opinion. We don't. We have as many opinions as people, exactly like in the Jewish community, you know. So, uh, and I wanted to, to show that as well to open this window and show the Israeli community that you have to take because also when you see Ala and, you, and you, uh, Rani, sorry, call them by the name of the actors, uh, if you see these two characters and there's Mona in the middle, practically quite in the middle of the spectrum. So there's this escapist and there's this very nationalistic kind of guy and Mona is walking the line uh, somewhere in, in the middle of that spectrum, trying to find her way, trying to find her own uh, identity within all these identities. Um, so I, I think uh, this was the, the opportunity. Since I don't see any um, hands up yet, let me ask us a, a second question. Um, and that is uh, how you think things have evolved or what you were thinking in making Muna in relation to Arab labor. It seems like Arab labor um, uh, concentrated more on humor. And even though there is a humor and entertainment in Muna, um, it also maybe uh, treats um, heavy subjects often um, not not always with that humor attached to it and yeah. you know um, whether how things kind of evolved kind of in one to the other how you were thinking of it in those terms what it may or may not say about an evolving Israeli society in terms of people being um, you know watching this and 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 engaging in these subjects to a greater extent but they're perhaps also being backlashes to it so you know how does it work in relation in your own thinking and what might it reflect on kind of um, counter trends in Israeli society in terms yeah. of uh, these subjects? Well, for, first of all, 
I, we said it before, I don't know who was listening already, but I, I love Arab labor because of what it did. It managed to bring so many important issues to primetime TV and the Arabic language into people's houses through humor. I mean, humor is such a great tool because, because you know, it opens the heart, people want to have fun, but you can always also add a lot of messages into it. In some way, I do think that Muna could not have happened if there wasn't an Arab labor before. Uh, we had four seasons of Arab labor. The first one kind of came in as an underdog, you know, but soon it became uh, like a this cult uh, show on TV. And then we had three other seasons, very successful seasons. And I think it opened the door, the humor and the good stories, the good stories and also the conflict. I think it was the first time where really people kind of got a glimpse into that, that very particular conflict because of course everybody's conflicted you know uh, any identity is somehow conflicted but into that very specific conflict um, they got a, a nice uh, window with a lot of humor now when I my style is very different from Sayyid Qashur uh, style Sayyid Qashur is the the person who created and wrote Arab labor and he is very humoristic even in his writings for the newspaper and his books He's a very humoristic person. He knows how to use humor. He's a very cynic kind of person. Of course, I came with a different kind of style because I am different. And of, and of course, it's. I think it's the first time. I know, I don't think. I know it's the first time that the, a, main, a woman main character, Arab woman a main character, a, was put on Israeli TV where in, a, in a show that a, majorly speaks Arabic. So the Arabic language here was even a bigger portion than the Hebrew language, which is again, a, a very new kind of a thing. This is watching something that is authentic in its authentic language and not trying to somehow, um, you know, a balance out the languages or, you know, put more Hebrew so that people would find it easier to follow. And people followed it. I think if, if people are more intelligent and more capable of than what uh, TV executives sometimes think. Um, but this is the first time that we have a drama, a drama series. Of course, you, there is humor, like you said, but it's, a, it's basically a drama, a series about a main woman Arab character. This is history. <laughs> and it wouldn't have happened, I think, if, if we didn't make Arab labor before. This, this, this is a, a natural trans, you know, a, a transition of things. You open the door and then you open it a little bit more and then a little bit more. And I'm hoping that the next uh, work here also will, that, that Muna opened a door for more and more and more things of the sort. We'll, we'll await more questions and we welcome everyone, especially also the students um, to ask questions. Oh, I see a question. Um, I see a, a uh, hand raising. Car Carmela, go ahead. Carmela. <laughs> Unmute yourself, Carmela. Ah, yes, the button. Sorry. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I saw Muna maybe three times. Ooh. I loved it. There were so many issues packed in that it was incredible. And the acting and everything was really, I loved it. So thank you so much. And I want to ask you three very quick questions. Okay. Okay. So in your in your mind, Muna is an Arab or a Palestinian woman. <laughs> I think okay. for Israel is, is very different. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with you that we think about Palestinian as one group, uh, but either sides are not one group and we all have different opinions. The second question is, uh, I love the fact that the, the two characters are talking in Arabic and in Hebrew in the same time. And I see it, for example, living in diaspora where Israelis talk uh, Hebrew with English words mm -hmm. weave in. How realistic, I wanted to know, it is really. And, and the last question is, um, she was filming uh, Olive Tree, 
Mm -hmm. And for me, it was more than just the the uh, debate or the issue of um, uh, settlers destroying uh, the trees. But did you make the olive tree as a statement that Palestinian has roots in this land? Like the tree seemed very old and ancient and very rooted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carmela. These are like three packed questions there. They're not very small at all. Okay, but uh, I wrote them down, so uh, we're good to start. So is Muna Arab or Palestinian? When I'm gonna transit, transmit it to Mira, is Mira Arab or Palestinian? Because I get the, the same question all the time. And this need for us to decide whether I am Arab or Palestinian is of course an Israeli need uh, because there is this um, scary, kind of connotation with us choosing to be Palestinian, as if saying that I am Palestinian is denying the existence of Israel or claiming that I belong to Palestine or to the Palestinians more than Israelis. I will tell you how I see it. You know what, if Muna was a real character, I would actually address the question to her because each one of us defines themselves differently, okay? So I call myself, for example, Palestinian Israeli because I come from Palestinian heritage. My father is Palestinian, was born in Palestine in 36. Um, we sell, our dialect is different from other Arabs. Uh, our food is different from other Arabs. Our, uh, our traditional clothing is different. Our music is unique to Palestinian uh, music. So it's different from the Lebanese, from the Syrian, from the Iraqi, from the Egyptian. And therefore, it's a heritage thing for me today. I know I'm not going to move and live in Ramallah, but for me, I will always have the, the Palestinian dialect. So therefore, for me, I am Palestinian. And of course, I'm Israeli because I'm an Israeli citizen. I was born in Israel in 75, you know, <laughs> and I carry the citizenship and I'm part of, of the media and, and everything and the life here. And I'm married to a, a, Jew, a half Jewish a man. And I speak Hebrew more than Arabic in my everyday life. So of course I'm Israeli. Now, some people would choose maybe to call themselves Arab and, and, and connect themselves to the Arab nation in more general. That is freedom, you know, each one of us might uh, call themselves, I also call myself Arab because it's a fact that I'm Arab, I'm Arab speaker. So it's, it's, it's this, um, again, I, I always talk about how much need there is for our surrounding to put us in little boxes to make it a very kind of specific um, categorized box, but sometimes the box is not big enough. Uh, and I, that's why I, I have a difficulty with pinpointing identity. I think identity is much bigger and the more we open it up and, and make it expand, the better people we are and, and the easier life is because the more pinpointing inside this, because if you wanted to be very, very specific, then we should say that I am Israeli Palestinian. I am Christian Palestinian. I am Orthodox Christian, Greek Christian, not Catholic Christian. I am Christian, Greek Christian from the village Rami, which is very different from being a Greek Christian in, in, in Greece. Okay, so, and my mind just cannot live life like that of pinpointing more and more and more. I want to be, I want, I want my identity to expand and, and collect more identities and, and, and you know and include more identities so the more people i meet the more people my identity expands and i include them and their sorrows and their pains and their history and their rights and their strifes uh and i include them with mine that's why i work with the lgbt uh, community and i and i uh, and i work with the uh, with holocaust survivors and for me it's the same it's all included in my own in my own identity, even though I'm not Jewish or a Holocaust survivor. Okay, uh, but but I can I could contain uh, their identity as well and their pain and their history because I want to. I can expand my identity without it somehow uh, diminishing where I come from or what I feel like. Your second question: uh, mixing Arabic with Hebrew. Oh yes, man. It's very realistic. This is how we speak, and that's and I made a point of putting it that way. I didn't want to, I didn't want to clean us up. 
And I actually, it, it depends on the character. For example, Philippe character that Yael mentioned before, the very nationalistic kind of guy who feels very Palestinian, he would never mix, he, mix Hebrew words in his speech. So that's a statement. The, this person would never mix a Hebrew word. He would make sure that he knows the Arabic word. While Rani, the partner in the studio, he really doesn't care. He's living life. Just if you understand, I'm going to speak to you in Hebrew. Who cares what language I communicate myself with? So again, this is saying something about life here. And, and, and this is a measurement of how, how loose we take things or how tightly we take things. And people who, who take it a little bit loosely, more loosely, might include another language as well and not feel so you know, troubled that they, uh, they are doing so. So yes, some of us really mix Arabic and Hebrew. In my family, we for sure do it. <laughs> we also put in some Bulgarian <laughs> because my mom is Bulgarian. So it's like languages all over. And as for the photos of, of olive trees, the olive tree is a big, big symbol for everybody who lives here. I, I come from the Galilee. I come from the olive trees. And I don't know if you've, um, if you've seen the concert. I talk about my father. I talk about the video that I did with my father. And when I decided to film my own father as an actor in a video of my song, I filmed him in his olive grove. I wanted him touching his olive trees because I knew, I know that the sentimental relationship that this man has with these trees and what they mean to him. My father was expelled from his village in 48 and we were, we are, I am lucky enough that they could come back to their village and to the land. And this is a, is a huge connection for him. The, the fact that he could come back to his land and these trees are still standing there. These are trees that were planted by his grand, great grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, so for him, this is a symbol of, of remaining of being here, of, of still being rooted in this place. So it's, it's a very sentimental symbol, I think, uh, for Palestinians that sometimes are given, are given the feeling as if we are some kind of uh, newcomers or refugees in this place. I get uh, a lot of times people telling me, go back to where you come from. And I look at them, I'm like, what do you mean where I come from? I come exactly from here generations far generations back we come from here where do you want me to go back to <laughs> because a lot of israelis forget the fact that we are natives in this place and uh, i think uh, this is again why this symbol has become so important to to remind people that we are as rooted here as everybody else maybe even more than some but it's not a competition eventually, but we need to remember that this population, this Arab population, Palestinian population that lives here is native population. They were here. Now you can argue politics and say why they were here, when they came here, nah, they're here <laughs> and for generations. So yes, it's a big- Thank you a, so, so much. It's lovely. Thank you, thank and you I'm for your questions. And I'm going to see it again. Awesome. <laughs> Thank, thank you. you. Thank I you. think we, I saw in the chat um, two next questions. Uh, first was from um, uh, Dr. Vered Weiss, who I said also teaches Israeli cinema, and then oh. from uh, Professor Mark Bernstein, who's been teaching that class here for 20 years. Okay, so Vered, why don't you go first, and then Mark, you can ask your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you. Yes, I love Muna. I, I also watched, I only watched it twice thus far. Um, and... <laughs> I think it's good. <laughs> twice is fine. <laughs> Yeah, and I, 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 yeah, that uh, I, you know, I, I, I want to chime in with what Carmela said. There's so much going on, and uh, so thank you for that. Um, I have a lot of questions. I kind yeah. of decided to choose a couple just to start, so I don't hog the conversation. And I, w I was wondering if you could tell us more about the writing process, because you said that you know it started in 2009 with a small with, with a short film, and then it kind of yeah. developed. And I'm just I'm curious uh, if you can tell us more about how that gets uh, developed into into yeah. series. And then uh, cheekily, I'm asking a second question. Um, can you tell us about the reception of Muna? Uh, it, so so um, how it's been received in Israel and here in the in the US and in different places 
uh, I'd be curious to know how you your experience with that. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Thank you a lot. Um, okay, the writing process. Um, so, as we said, I, I've been an actress for many years. I, I actually also stumbled into acting by mistake. Like I, I studied music, and somehow got uh, derailed into acting, which I loved. Yeah, I loved that accident uh, of falling into acting. So I've, I've never studied the uh, script writing or writing in general, but um, but stories, I mean, we are storytellers. It doesn't matter. Performers are storytellers. So even if I'm writing a song or if I'm performing, I've been performing for so many years, uh, you tell a story, you know how to tell a story. And and um, when I sat down to write, I thought that, what I, that I would, was going to write, you know, some description, um, like some kind of what they call a synopsis. Today, I know the word. Um, but somehow it, 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 the story just took over me and I started writing also dialogue and I started seeing the scenes and, um, and I knew just what they would say to each other, these people and, and how they would say it and in what language and each of them had a different kind of language and, uh, and the story just poured out. Um, when I say poured out, it did not happen in an hour, okay? It happened, I don't know, uh, <laughs> it took a month or something for the first draft <clears throat> and then it took a lot more than that for me to get the courage to show it to someone <laughs> because I was really, really um, insecure about being a writer, how, how good it was. Eventually, I, um, I had, I had the, the privilege and the pleasure of working with a, um, an, an award-winning director and scriptwriter called Manny Blair at the time, uh, we did a lot of TV series and, and we became friends. And after we finished, um, I did a series with him called uh, Tebat Noach, uh, Noah's Ark. Um, and after we finished filming, I called him and I said, Rami, would you want or care for to read a short movie that I wrote? And he said, of course. Yeah, send it over. It. And so I started like, you know, apologizing and preparing him like, you know, I want your remarks, but don't be too harsh because I'm not really a script writer. You know, it's like it's the idea. It will be like, shut up, just send it over. And I sent him the script. Um, and after some time, I started, you know, nagging him. Look, okay, what's happening with it? What's happening? I need you. I needed you. Tell me if you read it or is, is it that bad? Is it that bad? <laughs> Eventually, he came back to me and he said, let's meet. And how is she scared? Because <laughs> I said, oh, my God, it's so bad that he has to tell me in my face, you know, <laughs> that it's so horrible that he, you know, had to meet me personally and kind of say it, you know, gently, whatever. So we meet in a cafe. And instead of saying that it's bad, he said, I think this needs to be a TV series. And I'm like, aha. And would you direct it? And he said, yes. And so he became my mentor uh, for uh, breaking it down into, into a bigger story, into a wider story, into episodes, and into a drama that takes place in a longer time, in a bigger kind of range. Uh, unfortunately, eventually, when we got, as I said, it took 10 years, when we got to filming, uh, Rani, Rani couldn't do uh, the direction, so we, 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 we got a, a another director to do it, Ori Sivan, but uh, Rani Blair was completely uh, my mentor in, um, in expanding the story. Now, when we started fishing for uh, TV channels or production companies or what have you, you need to kind of uh, uh, show a synopsis, like some kind of a treatment of the story. You need to show uh, which char the character, the, what characters are going to be there, and you kind of need to write a couple of episodes to show the flow and the style. And so all of that I did, okay? I, I sat down and I wrote two episodes. Uh, I wrote uh, the treatment and I, and I told about the characters. And this is how we started uh, looking for funding and for, 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 TV, for a TV channel practically to take it on, to produce it. Um, so that initial writing I did. Eventually, when we got Channel 11, uh, the, the National Israeli um, Channel, to take it on, uh, we brought in uh, a scriptwriter 
uh, our head script writer is uh, Maya Hefne, another woman, but an Ashkenazi woman. <laughs> and uh, she wrote the actual episodes that you see uh, on TV. Of course, uh, with my help with, with the Arabic, uh, char Arabic speaking characters, uh, because uh, it's not only about translating, it's also about how would a person express themselves, what language they, uh, so it was a lot of um, work together on the Arab the characters to kind of keep the authenticity of it. But yes, eventually Maya Hefner came in and she became the head uh, scriptwriter and she, she put the whole, you know, arc of drama together and did this uh, wonderful work. So this is the process. <laughs> um, and then you asked about how it was received. Um, uh, can I, I actually uh, yes. ask a quick follow-up? Because yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just, just, just a quick, so it sounds like really like a, like a, 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 you know, I don't remember who talked about the fact that it's a very um, woman, you know, that it's, it's, it's a woman's um, series. And now that you talk about this collaboration, it, it really sounds like that that was the force behind. Yeah. And I'm just curious if if you know the tensions. Uh, so Carmela asked about uh, Arab Palestinian, and I'm I'm curious about the tension between you know being a woman and being a Palestinian. Um, that's you know because uh, you know if 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 we're fighting uh, for for Palestinian liberation or for women uh, equality or for LGBTQ uh, plus equality. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious if you could say a few more words about that. Thank you. Well, I want to concentrate on saying a few, I, I don't know if I understood you completely, but I'm going to take, talk about being a woman in this industry. Okay, because we tell the story differently. We definitely shoot the scene from a different angle, physically, physically a different angle. And it's not easy to work with uh, an industry that is filled with men. I'm not saying they are all ignorant or don't know how to work with women, but I'm saying they see reality like they see it. They don't see it through my eyes. And it was a struggle. It's not easy. And that's why actually I have aspirations of directing my next work, because I think as women, we have a different way of shooting, a different way of telling, a different way of writing. Um, you know, I'm not talk gonna talk about a uh, Muna. I'm gonna talk about a different thing. I'm gonna talk about a video clip that I'm supposed to direct for a young uh, singer. A young singer, beautiful singer, very young, very, you know, TikTok kind of style, which is cute. And she has very, really wonderful voice, really wonderful music. And I was approached to kind of suggest a script for a video clip of a song of hers. And I love doing video clips. It's the, the ultimate combination, good combination for me of music and, uh, and visual. And I suggested a script that she really liked. Um, I talked to her on Zoom because she's not from here. She's from UK. And uh, she really loved it. And then I started uh, talking with a uh, photographer who, who might be co-directing it with me. And the differences when we write, we re, I mean, I wrote the script. So the difference where we're reading the same words, but seeing something so different that simply tells another story, simply different story. If I see her in my mind wearing, you know, waking up in the morning, I see her in a pajama and I see her hair loose. OK. And how does he see her? Guess. I want you to guess, Vera, please. Probably waking up with perfect hair and makeup in a slightly smaller attire. Vaksha. <laughs> <laughs> so he saw her that she is naked but holding the sheet against her breasts. Okay. And I'm like, man, I don't know. We wear pajamas. <laughs> you know, so. I wanted to I wanted to show something real. He wanted to show this image of something else. I'm not saying which is better. I'm not saying better. I'm saying different. I'm saying it's a different story. We tell different stories from the same angle. We can tell a, a, a hugely different story. And I think there is big importance 
to let women tell stories. Let them tell them the way they see them. We, the industry is so manly that there is so much pressure that you might not be seeing it the right way. You might be mistaken and it won't sell or it won't be, you know, people will not want to watch this because it's not so appealing. And you know what? Maybe in the beginning, the crowds need to be educated again. To, re, to be re-educated into what they want to see in the frame. Because yes, we have educated them for years to see a woman waking up in her full attire of makeup, but no attire and wearing anything. And with a nice, you know, satin sheet, just, you know, uh, you know, hiding whatever is not supposed to be in the frame. <laughs> So we need to re-educate them through our eyes. And yes, we need more women directing, more women writing, more women uh, designing, more women filming as photographers, photographers and uh, video videographers to show the frame, you know, another frame, a different kind of frame. We need a lot of re-education also to ourselves as women, because we are also kind of, we have believed this dogma for many, many years that they know, they know how to do it. It's a very, very man-controlled business and it's not easy. I'm not complaining. I think uh, we have, this is an opportunity. This is a good time uh, to be doing that kind of re-education of, of audiences to expect different stories, different kinds of stories. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As you can see, it's a, it's, a, it's a burning matter for me. Of course, I, uh, of course. Yes. Of course, yeah. it's, um, you know, can can the uh, the master's house be dismantled using the master's tool is uh, is a question we've we've been asking for you know about literature but definitely about uh, cinema and television as well yeah um, and you. visual is such a strong thing it it, it it it's it's just the, the subliminal messages in 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 so many things is crazy so yes, we need to reconsider and to re-educate ourselves on, on, on what we're showing. Yeah, well, thank you. I applaud what you uh, just said. I think um, Professor McBernstein has a couple of questions. Um, and uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Mark. Oh, I don't know. Hi, sorry, I'm in the car, believe it or not. So I'm very sorry. <laughs> I'm celebrating, going to celebrate my mother-in-law's 90th birthday, so I have a good excuse. Ah, cool. <laughs> I just wanted to add, Mira, I, I love your work. I, I think you are amazing and an inspiration, both in your artistry and your humanitarianism. I'm just wondering what you think the next step is. I agree with you totally that, um, you know, Arab labor was a way to open people's minds through humor in a very um, self-deprecating, but also very poignant and pointed way. And, and now we have Mona as a, as a drama. Is it, what would you see perhaps as a, the next step? Oh, I don't know if I, if I know what genre the next step, but I do, listen, we, we don't have enough arsenal of, of material to really tell the story of this minority that is living in Israel. So we need more and more and more stuff from every genre possible in order to start and have some kind of a round character. We are still, uh, in the eyes of the Israeli community, there are still a, a one mass of something. And I think we need more and more and more stories in order to take that apart and make us individuals and, and make us little stories and not one big story, uh, but little individual personal stories. And so I think we need, for now, I think the mission is to do more and more, as much more material and really doesn't matter which genre. It doesn't matter what story. It can be about uh, young people uh, doing circus. It can be about old people, you know, uh, thinking of uh, which retire home. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The, the most important thing is to, is to tell more and more stories that come from this community, for this community, and for the community that is living as their neighbors who don't know them at all. Um, and to open more and more windows between these communities, because we have a lot of material going, and you know, Israelis, Hebrew speaking material, um, it's very uh, varied and it's very good quality and it's out there in the world. And so we need more and more material coming from the Palestinian story, 
uh, with or within within Israel or without Israel, you know, it doesn't matter. But uh, I speak as a Palestinian living within Israel. I need more and more stories to to be out there in order to start to feel that we have told a part of our story about a part of our stories. Because again, we are not one story. We are many, many stories, and we don't have enough representation on TV and in cinema. Thank you so much. I, I we maybe have time for just a, a couple um, more questions. Um, so uh, one question maybe I'd uh, like to ask two questions I'd like to ask, and maybe also then you could talk about the reception because we uh, how how it was received. Oh, yes within Israel. Um, and the two questions are to also to follow up on kind of um, you as a female creator um, and working with other females in the story is that, um, you know, in addition to the things that you mentioned, there are other themes that maybe you um, discuss in Muna that may not have been discussed um, if it was uh, producer written by a male such as domestic violence. So that's yeah. one question. And the second question that relates to kind of my initial questions and to domestic violence question, of course, some of your themes are inherent to the Israeli context, but many themes in terms of how you negotiate your, your um, identity as a minority in a country. Of course, it's exacerbated by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the Israeli context, but things that are specific to the Israeli context, but also universal. And the same thing with domestic violence. So it might be specific um, to both Jewish and uh, Palestinian communities in Israel, but of course it's universal uh, yeah. as well. Um, so I guess maybe uh, speak, if you could speak to that, to addressing things like domestic violence and, and your, yes. your thinking behind that, yeah. So um, addressing domestic violence is very important for me. Um, growing up in an Arab village, I'm not, not that uh, in my village is uh, you know, uh, primitive or anything. I come from a very, very advanced kind of place and uh, very educated, but still we had women being murdered. And um, and um, and again, not that it's uh, it only happens in the Arab community. We have enough women being killed all over the world, which is a pandemic, uh, if we want to call it that even. Um, but yes, and I always felt that, especially in conservative communities, these are things that people don't speak of. Like it, also in the Orthodox Jewish uh, community and any any community that is conservative, these are these are things that you keep within the home, and you solve them within the family, and you don't want to air your dirty laundry. And for me, it's important to air the dirty laundry; otherwise, it stinks, and it will always stink. So of course you have to air it and you have to talk about it and you have to show it. Now it was a dilemma because I, I was afraid to um, to put too many stories with Muna, um, but it was but this story of her her friend who was left behind in this kind of uh, uh, alternative uh, reality was important for me. Um, even in the short story that I had written, the short film there there was this character. Uh, she actually died there. It was a much harsher story because it was based on a, on a real story of a woman that I knew. And um, so it was very important for me to, to bring this. And again, if you, if you notice, we never see him hit her. We never see Adnan hit his wife. Um, we never see him treat her badly even because this is how it happens. You don't really see the man hitting his wife. You might hear them shouting from the other home. You might see bruises when she comes to buy her grocery or she's walking the street, but that's it. And, and I don't think even people will ask what happened to you. So it's unspoken, it's unseen. It's something that happens behind closed doors. And that's how we kept it also. We didn't want to go into the pornography of violence uh, within the domestic uh, home because it's not how it happens. It, it happens under silence and being silenced and being hidden to, to the extent that the woman is feeling guilty for leaving, for, for changing something in the, in the, in the way of life, for, for trying, for thinking for a moment that she deserved anything else. And we, if in the end, we, we even don't know if she goes back to him. Maybe he didn't hit her. Maybe she, maybe it was something else. Maybe something else is going on there. We, we don't know. 
and we and and it was intentional to keep it that way because this is how I always saw it. You never know, but you know, you know very well, but you never know, right? <laughs> like, like always, these the silence about uh, violence against women. Uh, again, this is a, a matter that really pains me, and uh, I cannot believe that we are still talking about it in 2022. But yes, we are still here talking about it. Uh, violence against women, women har harassment against women, injustices against women, inequality of women in the working place, in the home, in, in the world, in politics, in cinema, and wherever. We still have a long way to go, and it's unbelievable. When I was a kid, I thought 2022 is going to be like so futuristic. Women are going to be everything. <laughs> We're going to be Amazonas again, you know? <laughs> Um, but yeah, the road is long. So maybe um, you could speak to um, how it was received, you know, um, within Israel, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up soon. And I, I see that Professor Mark Gerson had another couple of questions. Um, we'll see how much time we have, which is not much <laughs> in terms of uh, your being able to respond also to, which kind of relates um, maybe to um, your project in terms of promoting kind of um, better relations uh, between um, Jews and uh, Palestinians in, in Israel through the, the projects that you're doing and what we all have put that on the website again. Um, there's a question also um, that uh, relates to um, the hope that you continue um, to have and build with um, from Professor Bernstein as to whether you still think a two, moving towards a two-state solution is possible and, 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 and perhaps kind of uh, and you don't have to address anything personal, but in terms of um, the decisions many parents make, but also yourselves into how, how to build this future for, for your kids as well. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so I don't know, you, you can choose, right. uh, you okay. can choose them among them because each of these could be a half hour answer yeah, as, to, yeah. as to what you'd like to address. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do this shortly. So first of all, uh, I, I was um, surprised that Muna was, uh, received so well. <laughs> I was sure we're going to angry a little bit more people, but uh, maybe it's a good sign. I don't know. Uh, I was waiting for some harsher uh, comments, but uh, I think the series was uh, accepted really fast, really quickly and really well. Um, the thing is, I, I was uh, I was kind of preparing myself that maybe my own community, the Arab community, uh, would kind of revolt against the really the usage of domestic violence, because some people say, like, why do you show us we are always violent? You know, we're not all violent against our wives. And I say, like, we're, I'm not saying everybody's violent against their wives, I'm saying some are. Um, so sometimes people, like, they say, they see one story and they think it, it, it's supposed to represent the whole community. Um, so of course some comments here and there, but in general the the series was had amazing reviews and uh, and people uh, really connected to it well. Now I don't know uh, there was something about the two state solution, man. <laughs> I'm like you know what I'm I'm in a stage of my life that I say I don't care I, I don't really care how we do it to what, how do we cut this place or we combine this place? Where do we put the borders? I think borders in general are a stupid notion, but people like borders apparently. So I don't really care if there are borders, if there aren't no borders, uh, where would we put the borders? How many states do we have here? Maybe two, maybe 11, maybe one. Uh, as long as we start uh, working out how to live, how to share this place. My one agenda is for us to learn how to share this place. And when I say this place, I'm not only talking about Israel, Palestine, I'm talking about this planet. Humanity has to understand that planet is not, does not need saving. We do, we need the saving because we're killing ourselves by killing the planet. The planet will go on, it will do its own thing. But if we don't learn how to share this place, how to share the resources, how to take care of each other. We are gonna, we're gonna vanish now after 20 years, after 200 years, 2000 years, doesn't matter. We're gonna end our own lives on this place. So it's the same for Israel and Palestine. If we don't want to perish and keep on this blood thing going, 
we need to learn how to share this little space of land that we have somehow. I don't, and I really don't care anymore what kind of solution, as long as we agree on it and we don't kill each other for it. Um, and again, the solidarity projects. Uh, oops, Chia is jumping. Um, if you go to my uh, website, if you're curious, if anybody's curious, there's a page there called Artivism. I called myself an artivist as an activist who does, does her activism through art. So there's a page that called Artivism with all the projects that I'm involved in. But the most important project for me, as I mentioned before today, is sponsoring this educational program that actually physically brings kids together to the same classroom and teaches them how to communicate, um, not only through language, but also like, you know, getting to know each other, getting to see each other on a weekly basis. If our uh, educational system is quite um, separated. Uh, we don't study together, Jews and Arabs. Uh, it's completely segregated. So when we do these meetings, these are kids who sometimes are meeting a Jew or an Arab for the first time. And suddenly they share a classroom with them for a whole year. I think that's a huge step in, 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 in the road to get to know each other, learn about each other, see something else than an enemy in each other, see how similar we are. We are the same age, we like the same TikToks, we like the same YouTube uh, channels. And uh, I really believe in that. And so if, uh, if you would like um, to, um, to you know, support this project, first of all, you can go directly and uh, maybe donate to uh, Shared Learning and the Abraham Initiative website. Or you can visit my, my online store, which is called mitrabymira.com. And there you can see also my designs. Uh, the Shalom, Peace, uh, Salam, and ah, you have the Good Word project that you mentioned, which is uh, these words in the three languages together, like hope and solidarity and thanks and life and love, all the good words. That's why it's called, it's called the Good Word project. And you can buy these uh, items uh, to your liking, and that way you can be supporting also the, the program, which I really, really, really care about. Um, and that's it, I think. Uh, thank you for thank lending you so me your ear. Thank you so much, for in, uh, both your concert and uh, the Muna and the discussion. You're, you move us. Um, they're very par powerful works of art. You challenge us and you inspire us. So thank you so much. Shukran uh, Tada. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who are on, uh, please uh, re remember to join us in 25 minutes. Uh,